we're just going to give it a little bit longer. So Kathleen and Stan, are you ready? Thumbs up, thumbs up. Okay, thanks for joining us today. Um, you are joining uh, Duke, Farm, Duke Farms remotely. Um, and it, once again, we are also joined with um, Stan um, from the Central Jersey Electric Auto Association and Kathleen Lewis from the New Jersey BPU Office of Clean Energy as we talk about Electric Vehicles 101. Um, and um, welcome to National Drive Electric Week. Stan's gonna talk a little bit more about that, but um, National Drive Electric Week is a really wonderful way that we, um, usually people who are interested in electric vehicles, it gives them hands -on, a hands-on opportunity to um, take out um, electric vehicle, look at electric vehicle, really kind of see it, and have questions for actual owners of electric vehicles. Um, that's the strength of a lot of this, is peer-to-peer -peer communication. Um, can't do that because of COVID. So we decided to bring this to you instead um, and bring it to our Facebook audiences um, and the, our YouTube audiences. So thank you for joining us. Um, we are going to do a, um, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat. Um, uh, right now, I think someone raised their hand, but we're gonna come back to that in a second. Um, so if you have any questions, again, uh, just look at the chat. So we're gonna do a quick intro and then we're gonna get right into it. Um, let's see. Okay, so here's our agenda. Um, we're just basically gonna introduce um, each other. Uh, we're also gonna talk about EV basics and benefits. Um, a talk about EV charging, um, technical aspects of that, EV technology, efficiency, and the environment, some incentives to make it more affordable um, and to incentivize you to buy an electric vehicle. And then we're going to take a walk around um, Stan's Chevy Bolt, um, which is pretty sweet, actually. So um, on to our next slide. I uh, just want to let you know, I am from Duke Farms. My name is Nora DiCiera. I am the Director of Strategic Planning and Programs. So my job is to create a lot of the programs, uh, work my, with my staff to create a lot of the educational, inspirational programs, um, and to really talk about strategic planning to bring us into the future. So uh, one of the things we do best at Duke Farms is walking the talk. So we're not only environmental stewards, we're leaders in environmental stewardship. Uh, we inspire our visitors to become informed stewards of the land. Um, as such, we have a sustainable energy plan, um, which has various uh, goals, including uh, reducing our energy costs in the short term and um, stabilize our costs and predictability in the long term. Uh, reduce our um, induced greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental impacts. We're basically trying to um, match and exceed, if possible, the greenhouse reduction goals uh, established in, in New Jersey, 80% um, reduction. We're also reducing our dependence on fossil fuel, fuels in particular and increasing infrastructure resiliency, um, as well as the thing that we do best at Duke Farms is really showcasing our, our energy sustainability to the public and really talk about how people can do it um, wherever they work and live. So what we do at Duke Farms, so we've done a, a lot of things. Uh, we have an, a lead platinum farm bar lead platinum orchid range. Uh, we have electric vehicles for operations, visitor services, and security. So if you come to Duke Farms, you'll see us in electric vehicles throughout the property. We also have a charge point um, for visitors and staff. So if you come here and you need to charge up, you can charge up. Um, we have a solar array, and that's also to do, we really hope to expand that solar array capacity because as we know, um, seems to be that, um, you know, we've got a lot going on, so we need a little bit more power. Um, we also have a bike rental program, we talk about people power, um, and connection to state and countywide trails. Of course, there's, there's always, there are always things to do. Um, so we have a list of things that we're trying to do, get accomplished over the next couple of years, including the DC pass charger um, that hopefully will be sooner than later. Um, we've got low cost, low carbon uh, electric supply, 
um, energy efficiency, supply switching, um, vehicle electrification for employees, as well as putting in uh, more public um, charging station. Uh, demonstration, that's another thing that we do really well, as well as some common kind of operational changes. So this is really um, important and near to dear to our mission of being environmental stewards and to uh, talk about that to our visitors. So this, this is just a slide with a couple of our vehicles that we have around the property, um, except for the Chevy. Chevy is not our vehicle, but the, charge, uh, the charging stations are available for our visitors. Um, and you can see some of the vehicles that we use around site and everything is electric. Um, so with that, I am gonna stop my sharing and I am going to ask uh, Stan to help out and to take this over. He's gonna talk about the EV basics, EV uh, benefits, charging, technology, efficiency, environment, um, and then he's gonna take us around his Chevy Bolt. So Stan, take it away. Thank you, Nora, and, and thank you very much uh, to Duke Farms to having me and to allow us to share our story uh, and teach the audience about electric vehicles. Um, this um, event is sponsored by uh, Nissan. Uh, Nissan is uh, the exclusive automotive sponsor since 2012. And this year marks actually 10th anniversary of National Drive Electric Week. And for the first time, we have a blend of in-person and virtual events. We still have two in-person events. One will be tomorrow. It might be rescheduled because of rain. Uh, possible rescheduled date would be Thursday or Friday. It is in East Brunswick Square Mall. And then on Saturday morning, we are participating in uh, West Windsor Farmers Market. So um, uh, that, that's about myself. Um, and uh, I will be joined later by Kathleen Lewis uh, from the BPU from the New Jersey's Clean Energy Program. Um, and just to tell you something about uh, our chapter. So Central Jersey is chapter of Electric Growth Association uh, is one of the many chapters. There are about 95 chapters nationally. Uh, our chapter is fairly new, but we are the most active uh, EV advocates in New Jersey. Um, our mission is to accelerate the widespread adoption of electric vehicles through education, infrastructure support and demonstration. And uh, uh, so that you know, we are a, a group. Um, this is myself, I'm the president, Alexander Brown, he's a VP, Caleb Cohen, he's the webmaster, he's in charge of this website. So this is the source of information you can check out when you have time. Best, Betsy Wang Iverson, she's publicity consultant. Jason Kaplan, he's our Tesla Club contact. Kathy French, she's event coordinator, and Ricardo Mendez, he's designer. He designed our logo. Uh, now I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, personal, my personal story of electrification, how it came out. So I actually got first solar panels installed on the roof of my house. Uh, that was in 2011. And there were some uh, additional modifications. But then in 2012, I got my first electric vehicle, which was Mitsubishi IMEF. It had only 62 miles, but it was very practical vehicle. Um, and I was do running t range tests, got 93 miles actually. I taped it on a video and it's on YouTube. At the same time, I joined Electric Auto Association. In 2013, I upgraded the electric panel uh, on in the house and I first, uh, use the vehicle to home power system when I was able to draw the energy from the vehicle back into the house to power the essential equipment during power outage. In 2014, Nissan Leaf, 84 miles, uh, certainly bigger vehicles, stronger and everything better. And then I actually exported Mitsubishi to Czech Republic. This is the country where I come from. In 2015, I also started working with my employer, Colgate Palmolive, and every year I would bring uh, uh, electric vehicles for Earth Day celebration. There was an EV show. And in 2016, I participated in development of, work, of workplace charging at Colgate Palmolive. 2017, 
second vehicle in the family electrified, this time Chevy Bolt, 238 miles. And this is the vehicle that I'm going to show. And this is the vehicle that my wife uses most of the time. In 2018, I joined Environmental Commission and I started my off-grid project on SHED, which is ongoing project. It's amazing how much I learn by putting all the, all the uh, electronics together. Um, and today I'm charging my computer, my cell phone, my lawnmower, everything from, uh, from the shed. And, and also in 2017, I have taken the environmental stewardship course with uh, Rutgers and uh, Cooper, um, extension, Cooperative Extension. So in 2019, I founded uh, uh, Central Jersey chapter and in January um, 2020, uh, Governor Murphy signed EV bill, uh, which is a landmark bill and uh, Kathleen will talk about it a little bit more. And then uh, obviously we uh, went virtual because of COVID. We are meeting every month uh, via Zoom and uh, everyone is welcome to join us. Uh, always first Wednesday in a month. So, and, and people ask me, so why did you start driving electric? What converted you? And you know, there are many things, but one of the critical was actually uh, the movie, Who Killed the Electric Car? Which was filmed in 2006 uh, by director of Chris Payne. And uh, it was a documentary that very, had very nice uh, elaboration on the reasons why uh, the motion of or the move of electric vehicles in 90s actually didn't survive. Uh, back then, California made its first attempt to mandate uh, zero emission, mand uh, implement zero emission mandate. Um, but car makers, they protested and they won. But in between, um, uh, GMC uh, developed a beautiful electric vehicle called EV1 and it was only available for lease. And the moment uh, uh, the legislation was re reverted, uh, GMC uh, reclaimed all the vehicles and they crushed them. So, so the doc documentary was very nice. Um, and uh, the moment I, I could buy first electric car, I just did because I was afraid it will be killed again. Uh, so now to, to, to the basics about electric vehicles. Uh, we are talking about uh, pretty much two things. One is all electric or battery electric vehicles, and they only have battery to power the vehicle forward, and they can be charged only from wall plug or charging station. There is no gas in it. And the second part, uh, second category are plug-in hybrid electric vehicles or PHEV. And they can use electricity from plug, uh, from charging station, but they also have a gasoline engine. In general, they have smaller batteries, they have slower charging speeds, and they cannot use fast charger. Uh, so what are the benefits? There are many benefits. There are personal benefits, there are societal benefits, and there are national benefits. Um, and I want to highlight with the personal that they are affo affordable, they're affordable, and particularly in terms of cost of ownership. So just not look only into the sticker price, but also how much are the savings during the ownership. I'll go into details in a moment. Better performance. Uh, they provide maximum torque from a standstill. So when you hit the accelerator, there you go. Uh, merging into the freeway was never so much fun. Environment, you could guess it, it's, it's about climate change, it's about air pollution, but also noise pollution because electric vehicles are very quiet. They are not silent, just, just quiet. Um, and then security, we want to stop funding terrorists. So I generated this specific table for ownership cost um, to, to make it kind of easier to compare. So, so gasoline costs about two to $4 per gallon. Lately, it's on the lower side, yes, uh, but is it really representative of the long term? I don't know. I put also here diesel um, as an alternative. It's a little bit more expensive, but the uh, diesel vehicles are more efficient, so you get about 10% savings. But then if you switch to electricity, then the math is completely uh, changed. Now the cost per gallon equivalent is about $1.06 if you just use regular electricity. And the savings versus gasoline is anywhere between 47 to 
But then if you sign up for um, time of use program, when uh, the rate is different during the day versus during the night, it's the best to charge your car during the night, at which point the gasoline, uh, the, the cost equivalent is about uh, 38 cents per, per, per virtual gallon, electric gallon, if you will. Um, so it's almost free. Service, there is no oil to change. Uh, there is no transmission to brake or to service. There are no belts. Every car has braking pads, but because electric vehicles use electric motor to, uh, to regenerate, to slow down, the braking pads don't get used as much. So that pretty much for the life of the vehicle. Also, you don't have to go to DMV inspection station. They will turn you down. They will turn you back. They say, hey, don't come here. If you buy electric car out of state and you have a sticker on your window, they will rip the, tick the sticker off and there is no sticker required. Some New Jersey dealers will give you electric vehicle with a sticker because they do it automatically, but it's really not uh, required. Safety. Many times people talk about the fires, particularly when Tesla is on fire. Well, there's just, you know, somebody wants to make a, a big, big article, but in effect, uh, EV fires are 11 times less likely versus gas cars. And then there are also gas station fires. Um, and electric charging stations, they don't catch fire. There is no fuel in them. So um, there is also substantial benefit. And there is improved crumple zone because in the front, there is no big engine, hot engine, you know. Um, and there is low center of gravity because the battery is in the bottom of the vehicle under the cabin. Emissions, it's truly zero emission. No carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, nitrogen oxides, hydrocarbons, particulates, and then the noise pollution is almost non-existent. Um, we'll go into details later. And then the incentives. Uh, there are several levels of incentives. The first to mention is the federal vehicle tax credit. Um, and uh, this one is a legacy from Obama. It's a 7,500 of the, the federal tax credit for if uh, the tax return, if you have liability at least 7,500, it cannot be broken into two years. It has to be used in one year. Um, but that one is limited for up to 200,000 vehicles sold per manufacturer. So there is no variable credit for Tesla and GM, Chevy for that matter. Um, then we have very nice New Jersey state rebates and Kathleen will talk in detail about it. Just a brief halo, it's up to $5,000 per vehicle and there is a roof, 55,000. Uh, for charging stations, if you install in your home, you have 30% uh, federal tax credit as well, which is active until the end of the year. And it can be extended as it was in the past. Um, Another benefit is no sales tax in New Jersey. That is applicable to all electric vehicles, not plug-in hybrids. And it's percentage, right? It's 6.6%. So if you buy a um, Porsche Taycan for 160,000, you will get almost $10,000 off because of that. Um, and some uh, local utilities, they also offer valuable incentives. Um, so what are the vehicles available? You can buy new, you can buy used vehicles. Uh, for new vehicles, uh, we recommend going to plugstar.com. There are currently 40, more than 40 uh, models available and the numbers are going up. Every year we have new models and they start at $17,000 after incentives. Uh, many of the affordable electric vehicles have range of over 250 miles, which is quite amazing. It hasn't been here like four years ago. Um, and for used vehicles, because they, those have very few moving parts, they are very good option. It's inexpensive and very dependable. The only thing that you want to check is the battery health. The battery technology is moving uh, so quickly, I will tackle it uh, in one of the next slides. Um, you may have seen the, the battery day by Tesla. So the older vehicles, they have the chemistry 
of, of battery that is no longer used in new vehicles, right? So it's not really representative of what's the current edge, but still the vehicles that you can buy that are five years old, they still have substantial value. I'm personally driving this Nissan Leaf, it's almost six years old, and I have still over 80% available capacity. So going to plugstar.com, uh, this screenshot shows first 12 uh, most affordable vehicles in this order, starting from Mini Cooper all the way to Tesla Model Y. Um, and I just want to highlight Chevy Bolt. This vehicle, it's, it's not eligible for federal tax credit, so it doesn't pop uh, up, up front. But what is interesting that recently GM um, provides uh, 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 they have a deal with Costco and you can have substantial, substantial deal on, on uh, Chevy Bolt. So it's, it's a vehicle that I would certainly recommend. The new models, they have uh, 259 miles range. The initial model, the one that I'm going to show, it had 238 miles, but still very, uh, very great vehicle. Uh, so this is Nissan Leaf, this is Hyundai, uh, Ionic, uh, this is SUV, Hyundai Kona, um, et cetera, et cetera. Here should be, um, I don't see, it's a Kia Nero, yes. Um, so when, when I put them all into one chart, you can see um, how the pricing uh, goes. And so uh, the, the New Jersey rebate applies for lots of vehicles. So uh, it, it, there are lots of options. And where you see the star, that's where you can apply the federal tax credit. That's why the pricing is so low. And another interesting way of looking into it is how much is the price per mile of a range? And here the numbers are a little bit flipped. The most affordable is actually Hyundai Kona Electric. It's about $86 per one mile of range followed by Kia, and slightly more expensive would be Nissan Plus, Leaf Plus, Ionic, Hyundai Ionic Electric, Chevy Bolt, and then um, even Tesla Model 3. Um, and then it goes higher up. You may notice that the Mini Cooper, which was all the way on the left before, it's now in the middle, and that's because its range is only 110 miles. So if you could consider the price per mile, then it gets pushed. This is a list of um, plug-in hybrids. Uh, again, this is only 12 models uh, displayed here, but I want to shout out a few of them. One is Hyundai Ionic plug-in hybrid. This vehicle has 29 electric miles and it has by far the lowest cost. It doesn't sell as well as the vehicle next to it, Toyota Prius Prime, uh, but it's certainly a better deal. Uh, another one is Honda Clarity. Um, so far, I didn't talk about Honda. This is the only Honda that has plug that is available uh, today in New Jersey. And it has nice 48 electric miles on all electric. Um, and then after that, it has gas. So um, I just anecdotally uh, can tell you that few owners that I have interviewed, they said that after this car, they will get all electric because 48 gives you enough that you realize that drastically, most of the miles that you do are all electric and you're just howling the gas engine with you. Another one to highlight is Toyota RAV4 Prime. This is a new model and it has nice 42 electric miles. The only downside with this model is that the manufacturing volume is rather low um, and it's offered only in uh, zero emission states, which New Jersey is, but it is available here. Uh, and lastly, I want to also shout out Chrysler Pacifica e-hybrid, which is the only minivan that comes with plug. And it has nice a range of 32 electric miles, um, after which it uh, reverts to gasoline mode. And it's after incentives, uh, it's less than 30 grand. So it's really good pricing. And then and there are many uh, other vehicles. Here on this chart, you can see that actually all of them are eligible for federal tax credit. But the, the amount of federal tax credit is linked to the battery size. So anything less than 16 kilowatt hours is proportionally downrated 
uh, credit. And, and then the New Jersey rebate also is applicable to many of those. So now let's talk about residual value. So this is an interesting subject because um, th those numbers that I originally got did not consider the, the incentives. And the incentive is such that um, you pretty much have to discount the, the MSRP instantly. And if you don't do it, then it appears as if the uh, depreciation is substantial. So after uh, correcting for those numbers, uh, what you can see that actually the electric vehicles, even though they still depreciate a little bit more other than Tesla, it's not as bad. And so you can see all vehicles and SUVs, right? This is all everything, gas, not gas. So these are non-Teslas. They tend to have a little bit high depreciation after three years, but here in this block, we have Model S, Model X, and voila, this is Hyundai Ionic Electric, right? So when putting into account that some of the depreciation is caused by $7,500 federal tax credit, the depreciation is actually not so bad. Now, what really stands out is Model 3. And the reason why is that because Tesla has um, uh, over the air updates and the Model 3 is still in high demand. So three years is actually barely uh, when the vehicle started to be manufactured. Normally we would talk about five year uh, percent depreciation and we cannot really tell in case of Tesla Model 3 because it, it's available just about for three years. So you can tell that actual electric vehicles, um, they still hold value. Now let's talk about charging. Um, from the technology viewpoint, there is a level one, level two, and DC fast charge. Level one is a standard wall plug. Every vehicle, every electric vehicle that you buy comes with a cord that will allow you to plug it into a regular power outlet, and you will get anywhere between 40 and 60 miles every night. Uh, level two is a charging station you can install in your home. It's uh, fairly inexpensive. Um, you might need to ask an electrician to, to install it, or uh, some of the manufacturers, when they supply uh, the vehicle with the cord, the cord is actually dual voltage. And all that you need is to install the outlet where you can plug it and you will have uh, level two, which will give you about 25 miles per hour of charging, which means that the vehicle will be always fully charged in the morning. Now the DC fast charging is something that is only in the public on around the, the major highways and you can charge in 20 to 40 minutes. It requires heavy um, gauge, heavy um, uh, wiring. So it's not something that you can install in your home and you don't want to have it in your home. It's just absolutely redundant. Uh, and speaking of uh, where you want to use uh, each charging options, uh, and I already touched it a little bit, um, you might have heard it, but really it's a big component of electrification is that over 90% of all charging happens while the car is parked at home overnight, like a cell phone. You may be also lucky if your employer offers uh, workplace charging, you can charge at work. Um, and there are also lots of public charging stations, but really 90, more than 90% is at home where it can be level one, but preferably level two, um, installed by a licensed electric, electrician. Um, again, at work, uh, you may ask your employer, uh, they may actually like it because it will attract uh, um, it will attract um, employees with this uh, education, higher education. Um, and then on the go, and these are the fast charging stations, to some extent still level two. If you go to a business, to restaurant, then where you spend an hour or so, then level two gives you a substantial amount of charge. And I would certainly recommend Plug Star. Um, uh, no, no, no. 
plug, uh, plug share, this is mistake, plug share, um, dot com. And this is the website. You can get app on your phone, Android or Apple, they are both compatible. And this is interesting chart. So in, in back in 2014, there were only 700 DC fast chargers available and, and they were either located on the west coast or on the east coast, but in the in between, not so much, so you couldn't really travel. Um, but then, actually, in 2014, Tesla installed uh, the supercharger network. So, so this is 700. Three years later, and the map is all orange. And today, in 2020, there are 14,461 DC fast charging stations available and growing. Most of them are uh, Tesla, um, followed by nobody, nobody, and then Electrify America. Electrify America is a fast growing uh, company which is lucky to receive uh, funding from the Volkswagen Settlement Fund. We have also ChargePoint. ChargePoint is most popular, most common for level two charging businesses, workplace charging, Duke Farms, they have a charge point, right? EVgo, unaffiliated, those are mostly dealers. Dealers also provide uh, rapid chargers, etc. cetera. Um, now, speaking of efficiency, so this is also interesting. Um, it, it, so I compare just Hyundai Ionic Electric with Toyota Camry, and the MPG numbers are so different. And, and then I calculated, so how much energy is being used uh, when the vehicle is idling? So the electric vehicle is only using about 0 0.2 kilowatts, while the, electric while the gas car is using already 14.3 kilowatts worth of energy. Um, and at 70 miles per hour, Hyundai is using 15.6, which is just a tiny bit more than the gas car at idling. And then the Toyota is using 61.4 kilowatts. So this is a huge discrepancy, huge difference. And there is another interesting math. So if we want to refuel both vehicles from renewable resources, how much land area do we need, right? So if we want to con uh, consider 12,000 miles a year, then for the electric vehicle, we can, all that we need is 125 square feet of solar panels, which is just about the roof that I try to show you. But if we want to get renewable energy for the gas car, that would be most likely bioethanol, then we need 0 0.86 acres. So the land area is 300 times larger. And sure enough, it will tap into the food chain. So it's really not feasible. And here comes the carbon dioxide emissions, um, which, is skyrocketing over the last 100 years and particularly over the last 10 or 20 years. You can see the steam engine development, internal combustion engine and the World War II. Um, and if we switch uh, regular gas cars to hybrids, then maybe instead of going steep up, we'll go less steep up. If we have electric cars powered by existing uh, energy mix, it might be a little bit like this. But if we have electric vehicles powered from all renewable energy, it will be flat. And that's what we want to get. Now, I'll go quickly into chemistry of combustion. I'm, I'm scientist, I'm chemist. Th so this is the formula for gasoline about. It has 87% of carbon, 87. And then you need oxygen, 12.5 molecules of oxygen for one molecule of gas. And then you get carbon dioxide and a little bit of water. So the math is actually quite a revel revelation because from one gallon of gas, which is about 6.2 pounds, we need 264 cubic feet of oxygen. But because we are not using oxygen, we are using air. We don't separate the oxygen from air. We need 1,259 cubic feet of air, which is about a, a bedroom, one bedroom. So for one gallon of gasoline, you need air of the whole bedroom. So for one pound of gas, we need 15.1 pounds of air. So if somebody tells you that um, gasoline has high energy and density, well, that energy comes out only 
only when it's burned with 15.1 units of air, right? It's just taking for granted that we always have that oxygen in the atmosphere. And after combustion, you get from one mass unit of gasoline about 3.25 units of carbon dioxide. And that's because for each carbon, there are two oxygens. So from one pound, let's say from one pound of burnt gasoline, you get 3.25 pounds. So if somebody says, hey, let's sequester carbon dioxide, then what it means is actually we take the carbon from the, from the ground, we combine it with oxygen and we put it back. So what it means is actually oxygen sequestration, oxygen, the one that we breathe. On the other hand, the lithium ion battery chemistry is all sealed in a box uh, in the case of the, the, the battery packing. We have anode, we have cathode, and what we are always told that when the battery charges, then lithium goes from the cathode to the anode, and it intercalates into the graphene. And when it discharges, it goes the other way around. What they don't uh, specify is that for every chemistry happening on the anode, there is counterpart on cathode. So in this case, and this is the, the, the very initial lithium ion battery chemistry when only cobalt is used. When lithium goes from one side to another, uh, the cobalt is also going to another side. So it's a, called the redox reaction. Um, and uh, you may have heard cobalt is, is a questionable metal, but we can use other metals on cathode. We can use manganese, we can use iron, and we can use nickel. Tesla is heavily using nickel. They have a, still a little bit of a cobalt and then they have some manganese. So this is completely reversible chemistry and there is no oxygen or air coming in. It's all sealed. It's 90% efficient and all elements are recoverable when the battery is no longer usable. You cannot say this about gasoline. So again, there is no combustion happening. And then what is the impact on human health? Um, and this is where the environmental justice actually comes in because most of the communities that are impacted by air pollution are the communities of color. Uh, for example, uh, uh, African-Americans are more than six times uh, 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 affected by asthma. Uh, and, and the diesel engines are particularly the problem because of the particulate matter. Um, carbon dioxide is not toxic, but the emissions from diesels in particular are very toxic and they are killing our communities, they are killing our children. And because of the particulates can enter our bodies through uh, the lungs, they can impact other parts of the bodies. They, they are known to impact heart, they can cause stroke, uh, they have impact on reproductive organs. They can cause low birth weight. Uh, they can have impaired uh, fetal growth, um, inflammation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's lots of negative effects which are not always highlighted um, by the fossil industry. And the fossil industry is the one that created lots of myths. And as I go through the five myths that actually pretty much Tesla debunked. The first myth is that EVs are weak, that they are just golf carts. That myth was actually broken in 2008 with Roadster um, very fast, right? EVs, they have short range. Well, that was broken the same year because that Roadster has 240 miles range. That EVs are small. 2012, they came up with Model S that is good for five adults and you can also opt for uh, child seats in the back. So that would be for seven passengers. That EVs need a lot of time to charge. Well, in 2014, they, they came up with uh, a supercharger network where you can go coast to coast and they keep developing the technology. It used to be um, 100 kilowatts. Now we have 250 kilowatt chargers, uh, version three. Um, and lastly, that electric vehicles are expensive. And yes, it's true. If you don't have the economy of scale, 
then electric vehicles are more expensive, but it's extremely fast technology developing. And, and now uh, Tesla has lined up path for even more affordable batteries. So uh, that myth has been debunked as well. This is also my favorite slide. So when people compare electric vehicles to internal combustion engine vehicles, they always talk about the range right? and then how much time it takes to recharge the vehicles. So if you look into this way, then internal combustion engine always wins because it has long range. It can recharge to 100% in less than five minutes. We typically don't recharge electric vehicles to 100% because it's not as fast. But the truth is that actually we are not talking about the range. We should be talking about time because time is what matters. So if we put the day on the time scale from midnight to midnight, then we actually have to acknowledge that we drive vehicles only a couple of hours a day. We drive them in the morning uh, to work and then in the afternoon we drive them home and then we have some errands. And so what is happening in between? So they, the gas car is just idling at home, at work, at shop. But the electric car, it's actually plugged in at home uh, and it can be optionally plugged in at work, at shop, right? So what we need to consider is actually daily driving range. And this is where electric vehicles really win. Plus, we don't have to stop at any refueling station on a daily basis because we plug it at home. So yes, it's always fully charged in the morning, no need to travel. And we have the flexibility that we can charge um, um, off peak. 64% of New Jersey residents, they own their home, so they have no problems to implement that. And also fume-free preheat. We are always being told that uh, we should think of vehicles uh, for the 1% of their uh, usage, dreaming that we will go long distances. But in effect, average Americans drive only 29 miles a day. And 95% of Americans, they commute 80 miles or less per day. So even the small old electric vehicle would actually suffice. We have congestions, we have scarcity, and actually in congestions, electric vehicles are particularly efficient. They are more efficient than in highway. Um, so yeah, again, there's lots of charging stations. Um, there are lots of resources. Plugstar.com. You can go to Plugin America. You can um, call the support um, and um, and our website. Now, I think I have taken already lots of time, so I will take um, uh, I will stop sharing. And uh, our next speaker is Kathleen Lewis. Kathleen, go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm gonna I'm gonna start sharing, and I'm glad the sun seemed to be doing some weird things before. So I turned my camera off. It seems to have gotten better um, as, as the sun moved away. So I am going to share my screen here. Can folks see that? I sure can. Awesome. So then we will start here. Thank you so much for that. I am gonna be talking on a, a much more narrow um, scope and talking about some of the really great programs that New Jersey has just implemented. Um, <clears throat> um, so, you know, for all of the reasons that, that Stan just talked about, um, we encourage folks to move, move to EV adoption as quickly as possible. But really, one of the things that we have done over the course of the last couple of years is to look at the impact that electric vehicles will have on um, energy as a whole in this state. And one of the first things that Governor Murphy did when he came into office was he called for an energy master plan. And as part of that energy master plan, there are seven goals. The first of which is about reducing consumption and emissions from the transportation section. So. This is really one of the, the key places where we need to be focused. And, and really what that takes is it takes all of you. Um, and it takes all of the companies and all of the residents in the state of New Jersey to um, move to EVs and, and to change some of our driving habits, um, to decrease our miles traveled and to look at decreasing emissions in a lot of ways. 
And I apologize because it looked like the, the cloud moved. So I do have a little bit of sun on my face. So I apologize if that is distracting today. Um, I had limited options this afternoon. Um, and one of the large goals that we have in the state is to move to 330,000 light duty electric vehicles by 2025. We are a tenth of the way there and we have four years to do it. Um, so we are looking forward to encouraging folks to move to that EV sooner rather than later. And one of the large ways that we are doing that is the legislature created an incentive of up to $5,000 when you purchase or lease a new electric vehicle. Um, that is a brand new incentive. We launched the post purchased incentive on May 27th. Um, and then we will be introducing the time of purchase incentive um, later this year. Um, the difference between those two is that post purchase incentive is essentially one of those those rebates that you would get at the at the grocery store or or at any of the stores years ago where we we tell you 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 purchase the vehicle, you go online, you apply for you apply for the incentive money to be sent back to you. Um, when we do the time of purchase incentive, it will be at the dealership. The dealer will be able to apply on your behalf and credit that money towards the vehicle that you were purchasing and will actually reduce the purchase price right there. Um, we do have all the information on our website, which is right at the bottom there, chargeup.njcleanenergy.com. So we invite you to go there um, if you have questions. Um, in order to get that incentive, there are a few things you have to do. Um, your purchase or lease must meet the following requirements. Um, it must have occurred after, on or after January 17th, 2020. It must be registered to you in the state of New Jersey. This is currently for private owned um, vehicles only. So not vehicles owned by your company, not fleet vehicles. It has to be you yourself. Um, your name must be on the purchase or lease agreement, and it must be from a New Jersey dealership or showroom. You can't go to New York or Pennsylvania, get a, a, get a good deal, and then come back and get that, that up to $5,000. You have to do it from a New Jersey dealership. And you have to prove proof of New Jersey residency through your state ID or other acceptable documentation. For the most part, um, if you are a New Jersey resident, you were showing your driver's license when you register the vehicle. Um, there are some limited exceptions for military personnel as well. But really, the, the, the largest thing is, is that it must be a new battery electric or plug-in hybrid electric vehicle and have an MSRP of less than $55,000. Um, and that is the final manufacturer suggested retail price of the vehicle. Um, that does include many of the add-ons. Um, if you're looking at Teslas, if you change the color, that costs you money. Um, if you go to self-drive, it costs you money. Um, those things all start to add up. Um, as an example, if you use any of the other, other vehicles as well, um, as they get towards that top of that 55, if you start adding on um, packages, then those often will go over that 55,000, and then you will no longer be eligible for that incentive. Um, I'm going to go back for one second. Just so folks know that incentive is up to $5,000. And the way we figure that out is it is $25 per um, mile of charge. So the, the longer the charge is for the vehicle, um, the higher that incentive is going to be. Um, for hybrids, it is, it is a much lower incentive because they don't get as much, much mileage per charge. Um, and for some of those that have a very long um, battery life, you're going to get that $5,000. Um, <clears throat> so that is, is sort of the overview of those, of that incentive. And I'm going to talk about a couple of the other programs that we have at the BPU um, to help inspire it and to spur on that EV adoption. First and foremost is the Clean Fleet Program. Um, one of the ways that we can spur adoption here in New Jersey is by encouraging other um, areas of government, so your local government, your, your township, your, um, your municipality, your county, your school board, um, to look to move EVs into their fleet as well. Um, and so to do that, we've done a few things. First and foremost, they're now included on in the state purchasing contract. So if you work in government, you know that that makes it a lot easier to purchase one. Um, and second, we are offering incentives, $4,000 per battery electric vehicle that you purchase up to two. Um, and then 
$1,500 for level two EV charging stations um, to be put someplace that can be used both to charge the vehicle that you're purchasing as well as um, for public availability. So we're very excited about that and it's a great way to spur adoption. The more people see EVs on the roadway, the more likely they are to consider them. Um, and then over the last couple of months, the BPU has been working on an EV straw proposal that we released on May 18th. Um, and it was looking about on how we are going to create the, what we refer to as the EV public charging infrastructure ecosystem. And that is what we are going to do to encourage infrastructure for charging, um, both public and private, um, and how those are going to work together. So some of those, those pieces have come to fruition. Um, just last week, the board adopted what we refer to as minimum filing requirements for the utilities um, to start to look at encouraging those programs. Um, that puts the responsibility of the make ready, so getting getting it powered up until the point of that charger, getting the electricity flowing on the utility and then private investment for putting that um, charging station in and operating that charging station as well. Um, in, in most cases, in a, in a very limited amount of cases, we are going to allow utilities to petition the board for areas of last resort to ensure that we have charging throughout the state. Um, we are also looking at addressing um, some of the obstacles that come with building out this charging infrastructure because we know that one of the things we need to do to spur adoption is to make sure that people feel as if they can get their vehicles charged. Um, so that includes encouraging chargers at multi-unit dwellings. Um, for those of you who own your own homes or live in a single family home, it, it is fairly simple. If you buy an EV, you, you plug it into your garage. Um, for those that live in multi-unit dwellings, it becomes much more difficult. Um, oftentimes, they are the ones that are relying on workplace chargers and, and other publicly accessible charging. So making sure that the charging rates at multi-unit dwellings was the same as at a residential dwelling is going to be important. Um, as well as for some of those publicly accessible charging stations um, to reduce the impact that demand charges have while they sit empty. You still have to pay for the energy that flows in. Um, and we are looking to address those as well. Um, and then we are also looking at a lot of different ways to address the barriers to EV adoption that are in our overburdened communities. So oftentimes you'll hear about um, environmental justice areas and low and moderate income places. So we are looking at additional ways to do EV adoption um, with EV ride shares, electrified transportation, and a whole bunch of other areas as well. <coughs> so with that, it looks like Stan is getting ready. I will say, we'll give him a couple, a couple of seconds there. I know that there was a question about if you don't have to take it to an inspection station here in New Jersey, do you have to take it to the inspection station anywhere else? Um, I used to work for motor vehicles and I used to work in transportation for a long time. So I will tell you that the answer is it depends. And the reason it depends is because in New Jersey, um, the inspection is emissions only. And in other states where the inspection is emissions only, then you will not have to because there are no emissions on your, on your plug-in electric vehicle. However, in other areas where they will have a mechanical inspection as well, Pennsylvania is one of those places, um, you would still probably have to take it in because they are checking the mechanical pieces, they're checking the tires, they're checking the brakes, they're checking all of those other things about your vehicle that do not change whether you use a combustion engine or you use an electric vehicle. Um, so I'm happy to ask other questions too, but I know Stan is going to give us a tour, or answer questions too, but I know Stan's going to give us a tour. Hey, Stan, I've got a quick question from Duke Farms. Um, did you want to take some Q&As now or did you want to do that at the very end? Um, what do you think? I, either or. Um, okay. Uh, why don't we do your presentation first and see if they're addressed in, the, in, your, um, in your tour. And if they're not, then we'll hop in and I'll, I'll ask you a couple okay. questions. Good. Um, there's some questions about like braking and um, the brake system powering the batteries. And I think you probably will address this. Yes, I will. Okay, great. Okay. Um, 
uh, I think uh, we need to unshare um, Kathleen's presentation. At least I don't see what I'm showing. Ah, okay, good. So. I'm glad it's not raining, by the way. <laughs> well, yeah, we are lucky. So this is my wife's car. <laughs> it's still registered in my name, but anyway. And it's plugged in. It's beautiful day. You don't see the solar panels because they're on the other side of the house. But I'm charging from sun right now. This is the uh, charging cord. It's called J1772. We just call it J plug. It's very simple. You just plug it like this and it clicks. That is it. And you do it when you arrive home and then you just undo it in the morning. You don't have to do anything in between. So, uh, so this specific vehicle has the charging port here. Nissans, they have it there. Teslas, they have it in the back. And then some other brands, they have it on the other side. This vehicle, it's a five-seater, it's a hatchback. And uh, it's yelling, but uh, I, I just want to show also in the back, there is no hump here. So you can actually have flat floor. It's lots of space for five passengers. I mean, for three passengers in the back. Um, now there are lots of things that are better with Tesla, but I want to show you something that I like with this vehicle. So imagine it's cold, right? I'm driving. Watch, I just press this button and this will turn on the steering wheel heater. This is a high level science. When you hold it with two hands, it, ho it heats your hands and the heat is transferred to the rest of the body. And then you actually don't need to use the auxiliary heater. Um, the other thing is I'm going to turn it on, which means that I depress the brake pedal and I press this button. And, you know, the instrumental panel is right in front of me. There is still some panel here. Uh, Tesla Model 3 has it only in the center. Uh, and in a few moments, the radio is going to hack into my um, uh, phone and it will come from the sound of, of the car. Um, so, you know, there are many things. Uh, I know that we are short of time. so. I will turn the vehicle off. And uh, I may show you also the rear hatch, which has relatively lots of space. Um, and uh, speaking of the brakes, so you can see still all the calipers and everything, but uh, the motor takes preference. So when I lift off the pedal from the accelerator, the motor actually goes into the uh, region mode and I get the energy back. Not 100%, but certainly substantial component of it. Now I would like to turn it, Nora, back to you and uh, I will be happy to answer questions. Awesome. Um, so we've got lots of questions and engagement on the chat. A uh, really quick one, I'm sure you can answer. What's generally the cost of a charger and installation? So the charging stations, um, okay. You can buy dedicated charging station on Amazon for $200, $300 bare bone. You can also buy something for $500 or $600 or more, which has all bells and whistles, connectivity. You can control it from whatever. I want to show you mine actually. Uh, let me flip it. So this is my garage and I am using this Nissan EVSE. This what came with the vehicle, but I send it to evseupgrade.com and then for about $300, they upgraded it so that it's good for 120 as well as 240 volts. And I just installed this plug, which in this case, it's a NEMA L620R, uh, but you can ask for any plug that you wish. The most popular is actually NEMA 1450. Um, and it came with another adapter so that I can use it. And 
you know, it's programmable. I can charge from six amps to 16 um, and I'm routing the cord. I'm charging both vehicles. So the Chevy typically parks here and uh, the Nissan parks there. And uh, one day I charge one vehicle, another day I park, uh, charge another vehicle. But uh, yeah, so, so the charging stations, uh, the cost is from 200 to 600. Did I answer the question? I believe you did, thanks. Um, then I'm gonna quickly go through the questions because there are a lot of them, oh my gosh. Um, our I believe I know the answer to this, uh, but are Tesla charging stations available for public use or only for Tesla owners? I think they're for everybody, correct? No, so Tesla has a proprietary, um, has a proprietary charger. And okay. so you can only actually utilize that charger if you are a Tesla. Um, one awesome. of the things that we worked with on on defining that publicly accessible is if you're utilizing ratepayer dollars you, or if you're using government dollars, you have to be available to everyone. Okay, that's what I was getting confused with. Thank you so much. Yes, yep. and, and so, so Tesla superchargers, they are technologically limited to only Tesla vehicles. But Tesla also has what is called destination chargers and they are essentially clone of level two. And uh, if you have adapter, you can use them with other vehicles. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to scroll back in the chat because we've had um, a lot of questions. So the first question we got way back in the beginning. Um, so the battery for the electric vehicle um, is continuously being improved. I assume the braking system is powered by the battery or is it a separate system? Um, can you answer? The friction brakes are operating just like in any other vehicle if that answers, but the, the regen is, is hooked up to the motor, to the powertrain, so it's constantly communicating with the, uh, with the battery. Okay, um, and then we had a question about the DMV, which we addressed. Um, uh, somebody asked a really quick question about electrical fire. I think you addressed the, the electrical fire is actually um, not an issue, correct? Uh, they are just statistically much less occurring. Uh, there is a difference uh, on how the fire happens because the batteries are encapsulated, um, but when the, once they are punctured through heavy uh, impact during collision, what can happen that you extinguish the fire, you load the vehicle on the truck, and later the vehicle will still catch fire? But I will say this, there is special training for all emergency responders on how to deal with collisions with electric vehicles so that they themselves can be safe and they can keep people safe because there are differences in how they catch fire, where they're going to catch fire, and all of those other, those other right. pieces. Okay, yes. actually, Stan, that's one of the questions I was going to ask. If you could pop the hood and we can get a, a peek underneath your hood, that would be great. Well, it relates uh, to... Uh, to the question. So, so the first responders, they need to identify where is the cutoff switch. In this vehicle, it's right here. Let me switch. It's here under the hood. So they need to cut this wire to disconnect the main battery and then they can use uh, uh, extinguisher. Um, yeah, if, if the battery is punctured, uh, f you know, physically, from the bottom, this is not going to help you as much, but uh, it's still procedure. You need to cut that wire. Uh, and every vehicle has a sticker on, on the procedure. It actually shows you where is the location of the uh, cutoff switch and where is the 400 volt battery, etc. Perfect. Um, Kathleen, actually, I have a quick question for you that you'd know. Um, Someone recently uh, purchased a used BMW. Um, are there any federal or New Jersey incentives for pre-owned, purchasing pre-owned vehicles? There are not currently pre-owned ones. Um, the incentive was restricted by the law in the first year. Um, there will probably be a public stakeholder process after that first year to look at where um, we are best spending those dollars. And I'm certain that there's going to be discussion about some of the pre-owned pieces as well. Awesome. Uh, Kathleen, the, mm -hmm. the sales tax uh, is uh, applicable for the oh, used the vehicle, sales tax, right? yes. Yeah. We don't consider that an incentive, but yes. <laughs> it still works as an incentive. It does. It does. Yeah. 
But there's no extra money there. No. Yes, yes, because yeah. it's actually factored into the new vehicle price. So it's as expected that the new old vehicles, the used vehicles should have it built in. So mm -hmm. that's yep. the whole purpose why the used vehicles do not have those. Awesome. Um, so yeah, really exciting stuff that's going on. So the public law that you're, uh, the law that you're talking about, mm -hmm. um, public law 2019, is that the chapter 362, if people are interested in the details of it? Created the uh, it created the incentive. I will be honest. I don't remember the chapter law. I think if you want details on the law, you really should just go to charge up, um, charge up .njcleanenergy.com. Okay. Is what is unless you really want to go into the, the to the to the legal jargon that got to creating, but but how to actually use the law, you would go to charge up that njcleanenergy.com. Nice and simple for us. Thank yeah. you. And we'll send the link out to everybody so that they have that. So if you're um, out and about and you don't have a pen on you, we'll send you that information. Um, someone asked a technical question. Can you charge outside during wet weather such as heavy rain? Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. Awesome. Because the J-plug is designed for all weather. You know, I can pull it out again. Uh, you can see how it's all uh, uh, embossed inside of the vehicle. I press the button. And you see the sleeve here, wait a second, the sleeve. So it's all, it protects the, the wires. You can touch them now. There is no energy, they are de-energized. Um, actually, it's inside. Anyway, it's, it's perfectly good for all weather charging. You can charge on your driveway as well as in your garage. Oh, that's so great. And I see Alexander Brown is putting the um, charge up duck njcleanenergy.com up in the chat. So that's there. Thank you so much. Um, Alex is also from the Central Jersey Electric Auto Association, correct? Yes, he's our VP. Yes. Hi. Um, okay, so uh, someone asked a question about charging prices. So Stan, you have an electric vehicle. About how much do you charge, how much do you pay when you go to different chargers? I know how much we are at Duke Farms, but I'd like to hear about your experience at charging. So, so charging outside of your home is al always a wild card because uh, it depends on the policy of the host. Uh, I always advocate that you have to have your own charging at home because this is, this is the one that is guaranteed. Yeah. Uh, and if you're outside of your home, uh, then, you know, if you, and, and you go to plugshare.com, right? And, and they tell you upfront, uh, hey, that uh, whether, how much they charge and how much is everything. So, um, Yes, so actually, so if you charge at rapid charging stations, it's a service. This is where the char charging tends to be very expensive, where you don't save actually much. Uh, but again, you know, those companies, they have a uh, low demand fee and they mm -hmm. have, uh, so uh, just, just to clarify, Tesla is not making money on superchargers. They're not. Right. So, they're, and there are, and there are a couple of different models for folks that are looking looking at it. There's a few different models out there. Um, one is a subscription-based one. Tesla uses that model. You get it free yes. for the first two years, and then you have to pay a subscription, and you can use it wherever. Um, some use the kilowatt hour. So I plug in. It, it, it's the most equivalent that you would find to sort of um, filling up your gas tank, however much electricity I'm, I'm, I'm putting into my vehicle. That's how much I'm paying for. And then some are by time. So I'm gonna, it's most of the time that is a level two charger and I'm parking here for two hours. And so parking cost me $5 and parking would have cost me $4, but I'm also using the charger. Um, and so there are different models. And as this, this technology continues to be adopted, we're probably gonna see some of those, some of those models winnow themselves out, but, but it will depend on where you are and what model people have decided to utilize. That's great. I know at Duke Farms, we, I think we are at 50 cents for three hours. So um, you can come in and grab a cup of coffee and, you know, and then we'll go back out. So yep. it, it this really- is great pricing. Yeah, decent pricing. <laughs> we want to be accessible. So, yep. um, so this is great. If anyone has any other questions, if they want to type it in the chat or in the Q&A, um, otherwise uh, we're going to wrap it up and I'm going to say thank you guys for joining us. Um, this is fantastic. 
Kathleen, thank you. Stan, thank you. Um, we're going to have to have you. I can't wait for thank COVID you. to go away because I want to bring your cars here and have an auto show at Duke Farm. So put us on the calendar for the spring. Let's hope that we get all this COVID stuff. Yeah. And just I just want to shout out for all the audiences who are um, uh, in the area. We have uh, in-person events uh, and they can just check out uh, driveelectricweek.org. Driveelectricweek.org. That's fantastic. Hi, and this is why we're doing it for our next generation, not only us, but our next generation of citizens. So, hi, hi, sweetheart. So thank you all for coming. Um, yes, this will be recorded. We'll send it out to everybody. It's also being shown on Facebook Live. So that'll be archived on the Duke Farm site. Um, you can share it, you can subscribe, you can like, whatever you wanna do. Um, but I can't thank you guys enough, Central Jersey Electric Auto Association and the BPU Clean Energy Program. Thank you so much. This has been great. I can't wait to do something similar to this again. Thank you. Oh, I'd thank like you. to thank also the audience. Thank you. So, and thank great you. question and answers. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. So great. Have a fantastic day and I'll see everyone you soon. You too. And I hope to see you on the road with electric cars. Yes, please do. Thank you. Thank you.